Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. Now, very happy to say our guest this evening on Wednesday Night Rugby is the Leinster coach, Leo Cullen. Leo, how you doing? Thanks for the time. Yeah, delighted to be here. Um, great honour to be asked. <laughs> We've asked you for weeks, months. <laughs> You've been avoiding us. I've been stalking you, so I have. To so, to jump off, I know you had a busy morning. You were at the Aviva Stadium. You were helping out with the As I Am charity. They're Ireland's national autism charity, and you were lending your support. They seem to be doing great things. They're giving out a thousand sensory kits to children as they try and go back to school at the moment. This is a charity you're very fond of. It's close to your heart. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, only recently now. So, like, this is the first event that I've done with As I Am. So, um, Adam Harris, who set up As I Am, um, very impressive individual um, who is autistic himself, um, through various different friends, really, like, in, you know, as we're becoming parents in recent times and we try to understand, like, our own children um, and all the various different challenges that come with that. Um, and some of the kids with different learning abilities and the way they learn. And, you know, from us, like as a, as a sports body here at Leinster, but like, you know, obviously everyone has their own family piece as well. So um, very, I've been really impressed with uh, Adam um, and the work that he's done. Um, a lot of it around, you know, sort of setting up a lot of different towns around the country. So they're set up like they're autism friendly. So um, making sensory spaces for kids um, we were down in the Aviva Stadium earlier on, as you said, and you know there is a there's a there's a sensory room in the Aviva. Um, so the more we can be inclusive, the better. Like you know, for us as as Leinster as a club, um, so there's there's lots of different things that are are hitting you know positive notes for me. Um, you know what the purpose of today was. You know, they're the as I am are giving out a thousand packs for for kids that are going, going to go back to school now. So huge challenge, so much discussion on the airwaves around kids going back to school. Mm. Um, and the, I suppose some of the challenges that parents have had in getting kids back to school. But then there's kids that, that are on the spectrum that are used to certain routine. That routine is now very different. You know, the, what the, you know, the walk around the streets, like it's, it's just different now, isn't it? You know, when you see people with face coverings, et cetera. So, um, for an autistic child, what that is like, um, the disruption of not having the, you know, some of the one-to-one -one tuition or some of that specialist care um, mm -hmm. is usually challenging. So, you know, the packs are about trying to set the kids up to for when they go back that they're able to, you know, be comfortable or as comfortable. So, um, trying to help out the the parents in many cases, yes. um, because all that early intervention is, you know, the, all the. I suppose the literature and research that I've looked at, um, you know, that early intervention is hugely important. So, you know, from our point of view, like the, the parallels are very similar because, you know, our guys have been, as in, I mean, the Leinster players have been on lockdown like everybody else. Um, and now you're trying to get back into, to, you know, small baby steps in terms of yeah. returning to train. You know, we, when we came back initially, we we're in very, very small groups. Um, where you know we're we're not like we're not even throwing rugby balls around the place, so to build it up to it's passing. Slow. Yeah, so social and distancing rugby doesn't really work, but we're no. making the steps step by step, but trying to be very cognizant of the fact that we have to take baby steps starting off. Very good. Well, as I am is the charity, and they're doing great things over the next while, and you were lending your support this morning, so we wish them well with that. So the legacy thing is that I mean there's just lots of pictures of Leo Cullen around the training ground and. Me in my heyday. <laughs> Look at me. Here's not how to do it. Yeah. That's what it was, basically. Um, and they're like, the players are looking, um, are we, I don't think we're allowed to do that anymore. Yes. <laughs> so I, I, I guess you know, the disadvantage of lockdown is lots of those older games being on the TV. I'm sure, yeah. I, I suspect they haven't aged as beautifully as they did no, in the mind. No, 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 no. It's pretty ugly stuff, Phil. Yeah. We had Dan McFarland. That was ugly. So, yeah, we had Dan McFarland on last night. And I was asking him, you know, we, you see he's done a really good job. Is the general consensus, would he have taken it if we'd offered it to him at the start of his tenure two years ago? And he said, no, maybe it's just that kind of type A personality. I don't know. Uh, five years ago, 36-year-old Leo Cullen, I presume you would have taken this. Um, oh, I don't know. Like, yeah, like, I, uh, 
there was the picture was was there was you know like the, the transition from player to, to coach you know like a, a you know as an avid sports fan like I've, I've read lots of bad stories about players doing it so you know you're not really the odds aren't really in your favor to do it very successfully um anything that i'd looked at so um i knew there's going to be huge challenges in it um big leap of faith really from the club so i've always felt like i've had huge support here um i think we've all tried to do things for the right reason um do we get everything right i don't obviously we don't you know so we we make mistakes along the way um but yeah you know, like i've had a lot of support um from you know from my personal side of my life family wise um and friends um and from the club have been amazing here as well so yeah like i think we're always scratching the surface in terms of um what's what what the potential is out there so you know i, I still believe that i think we're still scratching the surface you know we want to dig a bit deeper getting you know broaden the appeal of the game and making sure that you know any kid that's out there and in the province that you know has ambitions or any kid out there anywhere really for that matter goes and i'd love to play for that team that they have a genuine route of being able to do that so mm. that's something that we try to work on all the time and um, it's competitive space for kids and um, also there's other sporting bodies out there as well and um, trying to sort of sell the same picture but you know like when ultimately what we want to like you know success is like winning trophies and all that are great but like there's always a bigger picture out there as well isn't there you know like you want to like the proper what that word legacy like it gets bandied around a bit a little bit too much but like ultimately like you when you're seeing our kids are turning on to watch leinster and they're you know they're seeing or anyone for that matter is seeing i guess positive characteristics that they want to be associated with and um i guess that's what a proper proper legacy is but like all these things it takes a long time to build but it doesn't take that long to undo some of the hard work sometimes no i'm sure in that first season how calm were you you know, because it seemed like you were thrown in a little bit prematurely than might have been planned. Matt O'Connor departed. There were some grim days, as you well know. Uh, in that first year, you never, insofar as I could see, and I watched pretty much all your post-match interviews, there was never a crankiness, there was never a wobble, you never looked ashen-faced overly. Now, maybe you're just a damn good actor, but I thought you, you, I thought you held it together from a, just a calmness point of view. How much kicking was going on beneath the surface? How, how big a part of you was thinking, "Am I cut out for this at all? I, like this is not going well." I don't look back that much. To tell you the truth. I don't even. Yeah. I don't. It's hard to even like when he asked me these questions. I'm like, bloody hell! I thought we were talking <laughs> about something completely different, um, and that's reality. Like I, I don't look back at that time that much. Like you know, if I look back at it now. Mm. Um, you know, like you've, there's a, there's always a bigger picture in your mind and it's like, okay, well, like I understand what the bigger picture is and like, you can see some of the potential of training with some of the players and okay, like you lose a couple of tight games and like, that's the story for lots of teams out there, isn't it? Like it's the margins are so fine. You lose a couple of games and you know, then it becomes like this big catastrophe all of a sudden. So, um, yeah, know, but when wasps not. come to the RDS and, you know, record losing margin, you must be thinking, good God, what have I walked into here or no? Oh, yeah, but like even the makeup of that game, like I think it was something like I remember, like it was over seventy percent possession, and you know we're hammering away their try line, we don't score, like. But then you have to ask yourself the question, like why is that? You know, like like I don't want to sound like one of these coaches that just throws stats, convenient stats out there to to paint a certain picture. That that's, no, but that's it's in, it's interesting. Paint. You went you went logical straight away, you know. So you went straight into let's break down the problem, let's diagnose it, and let's fix it, as opposed to. Good God, my hair's on fire. That's the point I'm making. You had that natural sense of assuredness, I think. Yeah, I do remember being like, yeah, pretty frazzled after that game because of like it was the first European game. Like we didn't have a huge amount of lead into that game. Like even the preparations for that game, there was a couple of things where we lost a few players in the lead into that game. And like it's just little things, like you need a little bit of luck along the way, um, mm. which we didn't seem to get a huge amount of in those early parts. And then once you're out of the competition, then it becomes this massive problem you don't qualify from Europe you know like and obviously then the the rest is history as they say um and then you're not like you're out of the reckoning in the last two games and sometimes you get a bit of a blowout in the scoreboard and then we played wasps and we did nothing at, at stake and whereas they did and again you know even the picture of behind you Johnny went off at about seven or eight minutes in that game over in wasps and you know mm -hmm. then like we're a little bit scrambling even though we were good in the first half at all but the second half then we the score blew out but anyway as I said like that's it's a long time ago now 
Um, but it's just about like, how do we get better? Like, how do we get better? Like, you just have to be very open and honest about what that is. Yeah. Um, there's personnel, you know, is part of it. And you make some changes along the way. But like, when you inherit a squad and the season's up and running, there's the players are off at the World Cup. And, you know, like I was just, you know, sort of, maybe I was the only man standing here. Really, <laughs> it's, the, it's important to remember some of these things, you know. So, like, I'm yeah. the only person here. Um, <laughs> It's like, who are we going to give the job? No one really seems to want to do it. So um, there's a little bit of that. Like, and then you just make yeah. the best of the situation you're in. So sometimes you've got to just make the best of the situation you're in. Um, it's, it's, and you on you go and you take your step and yeah. you know, let's get a little bit better. And how do we focus on performance? Um, the club are very supportive. And like, you know, then the following pre-season, well, yeah. you had and, a and, and sorry, were, were, the, were the club always supportive? You never yeah. kind of got an inkling of, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking over my shoulder a touch here. No, not at all. But like I'm the same. Like if like I'd be very open. Like as in, we need support here. We need support there. Like and you know, some things we can get done. Some things then okay, that's not realistic. So and obviously you're working with the constraints with the union as well. And there's you know that relationship is is usually important. So um, it has to work for both parties. Um, but then you know like if you go back to what's the process, it's okay. Like at the end of the day, like we get to a final that season as well. You mm. lose in the Pro 14. Like. We have a very good performance in the semi-final against Ulster where we win well. Um, we go on to the final, we like up against Connets, like and it was just even the week in that game and there's certain things like um Issa seems to be quite a common team because he got injured before that Wasp game, that first round. He got injured, I can picture him getting injured. And um, we trained down in Greystones and he got injured on the pitch. And I was like, oh, maybe that was my fault, maybe a different service, blah blah blah, if we trained somewhere else. Um, um and then he broke his arm in that game against Wolves from the semi-final. Yeah. You know, like it's it's little things like that. So the influence of so certain personalities, but there's a there's a huge lesson in that alone as well because you can't rely on one player because mm. you know and that's something that we've become more adept of being able to manage that. You know, crisis. We're not a team of 15 individuals. We're like a huge squad where we use 50 plus players every year. And, um, we need to rely on players stepping in, whether that's mm on the day of a game um, where, you know, a player pulls out because of whatever that is. Um, you know, even like I go back to that Pro 14 final, <laughs> poor old Devon Toner, like his, he rings me like the day before, we're just about to get like leave here in New City and get a call, his old man just passed away. And like there was all these little subplots going on. Um, and yeah, like it is what it is. And like yeah. Connacht, we're the better team of the day. And like, you don't want to take anything away from them um, because, you know, like, you get beaten by the better team. Everyone has to deal with all these different variables being thrown at you. So it's important that, you know, you cover all the what if scenarios um, and that you, you learn that through experience. And sometimes yeah. it's a painful experience. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I can imagine if, if you fast forward then to your, your grasp or your handle on the job now, you've obviously got a brilliant management team alongside you, which is very clear. What's your day to day role? Are you out in the training ground? regularly and often are there certain aspects of the game be it line out or others that you're very much hands-on with or is it more of a standoffish big picture kind of a role um i sort of move around to tell you the truth yeah so um there's different aspects to that sort of the game so there's, if you think like the game is structured and unstructured um sure coaches like the unstructured game for us i think it's mm. been pretty well documented like the structure piece and how we launch from set piece. Um, so like, traditionally I would have had like from line eight, like there's usually, you know, you're talking 12 to 15 line eights on average per team per game. So how you set up defensively and from an attack point of view, how I work with whoever the backs coach, obviously Felipe and Felipe will come up with starter plays and how we go about trying to unlock a, a team from a defensive point of view, how we try and set up and every, all the coaches, will work across that since Robin comes in. Uh, Robin, again, like, again, you know, with the coaches that when John Fogley, it's great reflection, I think, uh, on him and the program that he gets recognition that he goes on to work with the national team, just like so many of the players. Um, but then what does that give us? It gives us an opportunity to go to the market and see who else is out there. So Robin has been amazing since he's come in. Like, if you think of that as a, like a, for head coach and call it what you want really like the job job titles are the job titles sure the way we work is you know very much four of us together and i guess feeding into that then as well it's emmett farrell who works as our kind of kicking and skills but he's also our lead analyst so um emmett again like as someone i've known since since school um 
and you know like the work that he puts in because he's scouting he's always looking ahead for us um he'll present back to the coaches as in the four coaches you know uh, something we have slightly different is, is hugh hogan who's a contact skills coach and like what is contact skills coach it's probably just the way we saw the game going and seeing the need um from a from a performance point ultimately so that's the most important bit but there's a bigger picture then as well so because concussion was such a big issue like the game of rugby is quite simple like we can complicate it but it's basically based around a, co a collision between a ball carrier and someone who's trying to tackle them um and whoever wins that battle you know or whichever team is yeah. on top there generally wins the game because what are we trying to do get the ball score down the other end of the field so like it's reasonably simple like you can make the game very complicated um so the contact skills piece is again but a lot of it is around okay like so from a performance point of view and how we enter and win this collision both sides of the ball um but then there's the there's the safety piece as well because you know like we want to make the game safe for as safe as possible and um, because again there is a contact involved um you know like i remember taking up rugby and loving it straight away and you run around and you can see kids the way they are like they're like as in have kids down myself and like you know some of the kids like love that kind of rough and tumble you know and, um but it's trying to make that as safe as possible so there's a huge amount of work that hugh does sure. in terms of working with our backroom team um physios snc coaches rehab coaches because you know, like even that return to contact whatever injury a player has learning from the past you know again this legacy piece like so learning from the past so a player comes through and the process is better for the next player so you know been talked about james ryan's injuries come back from a shoulder injury mm -hmm. so hey how did he get that shoulder injury so we'll dig into that and quite often it's due to you know poor technique poor footwork whether they're overreaching or whatever it is mm -hmm. same with the concussion piece like it's because players the tacklers get themselves in poor positions and get knocked out a lot of obviously talk around the tackle framework to protect the ball carrier but you know sometimes it's the, the, tackler. the tacklers yeah. are the ones that are the ones who more often are the ones getting knocked out so yeah uh, we need to understand why that is and, and you know, so we've done on, a huge amount of work on that yeah, yeah yeah on that broad point do you feel that we're, we're heading towards shorter rugby careers the physicality seems to grow year on year on year i'm sure you're looking on and can even see a difference from your heyday are we in inevitably looking at shorter rugby careers i don't think so no like and you know like uh, as you said like johnny is there in the background what is johnny now is he 34 or 5 not 100 sure you're the, you're the Leinster head coach. You should know Johnny Sexton. He, he, he only tells me he's in his twenties anyway, so I get confused. Um, I think Scott he's 30, 30, thirty-five this month, I think, and, and still going yeah. strong. But is yeah. that is that so, is that will we have thirty-five-year-olds? Do you think in another decade? But Scott Fardy, like he's another one, like so he's our YSL, so he is amongst the mm -hmm. group, and thirty-six, I think he is. So um, I think players get well taken care of now, and they get managed well. Like it's not like we're playing guys into the ground. So this idea, like you know, we had this discussion earlier on today. Like you look at the fixture list, and there's all these kind of big finals as such at sure. the start of the season. Then you go through your normal season, and there's lines toward the end. But like the reality is, like players get very well managed throughout that. We know we can only get so much out of players. Mm -hmm. You know, we we all know we want to, like as in we want to get the best out of them. So and them given their best, um, and you know, like so that's why sometimes some selections don't quite make sense for for the wider public maybe that don't have all the information and um, because like we get to see these guys and okay let's rather than play guys into the ground let's make sure that they're fit yeah. and well and able and able to give best account of themselves um you know and like you know when someone is missing it's a great opportunity for someone else to step in that's the way we view it and trying to train to you know make training be able to set guys up if that makes sense you know yes, so the way, yeah, no, the way training is um you know so lots of guys get opportunities in training and it's a bit more you know it's not just relying on okay well there's the starting 15 and everyone else just hold the pads like that's not the way we train will you be do you want to be a rugby coach for the rest of your life um i would have looked at rugby coach <laughs> who would ever want to do that now i'm looking i'm like oh my god how did i end up in the box there like being a rugby coach so I never really thought I would get into this gig, um, so I just I just do it because I I love it now. Um, will I do it forever? I don't know. This is the honest mm. answer. I, I honestly don't know. You can't think that far ahead in this game. Like it's you, know, you get a couple of bad results, you know, people turning you, um, and who knows where You're we gone. sit. No, so, I, it's ruthless. Yeah. It's ruthless. I, like, like is Dublin so important to you that you would not want to leave Dublin to pursue it? 
or would you be willing if you know circumstances were right to go further afield? Um, yeah, like, well, I'm from Wicklow, so make sure we get that in. Um, I've been living in Wexford for part of this recent time as well, so, um, so yeah, it's, um, I don't know, like, yeah, like, the, rugby gives you amazing opportunities to see parts of the world. Um, you know, I was looking up to play in England for a couple of years, you know, yeah. that came, that move came very, very quickly. It wasn't like I was unhappy in Leinster, uh, oddly enough, it came off the back of a number of coaches, um, and you know there was, it, I wasn't really clear where we, you know, where success was going to come from really. And I needed to challenge myself in a new environment. I was 27 years of age at the time, mm. so um, but it was an amazing experience. You know, from a coaching point of view, will I get the opportunity to do that at some stage? We'll wait and see. Like, there's some great clubs out there, great teams. Um, you know, but like, there's like, as in, this is my home club. Like, there's certain yeah. pressures that come with that. Um, but I try to treat them as all positive pressures. Like, like I love getting people's opinions on what we should be doing better, or we're not what we're doing particularly well. So, or round selection, or whatever it is. So, um, who we should sign, or et cetera, et cetera. Like because yeah. you know, like I know it means so much to people, and it's amazing to work in a type of environment like that. So you've been in professional rugby all your adult life. It's an unusual way to make your way through the world. What do you think are the main pros and cons of that life? Um, the pros are doing something you really enjoy, assuming that you do enjoy it. So, um, and I enjoy the process of getting ready for a game. Um, I've missed probably not having, like, you know, the lockdown has been fantastic because, you know, again, I'll go back to this point of going back to family, but I'll, maybe I'll go back to that. Um, there is the, you know, when, when you don't have a game at the weekend, you don't have that kind of, like that kind of this is what it's all for like you're getting ready and it's trying to get better week by week but then everyone gets to see the fruits of your labor so to speak because you can see it like your your the what's out on the pitch is kind of a that's the end result of all the work that has gone in from everybody that so everybody feeds in who's the most important person like i don't know <laughs> you know like who is the most important person? Ultimately, it's the players because they're the ones who've got to deliver it on the day. So, mm. um, all the different bits that go into feeding into that. Um, the positive bit, like of not having had the games, is you know the family piece, and you get to reconnect more. So that's probably one of the challenges of coaching because it's it's like it's pretty full on. Like uh, most yeah. coaches will tell you that. Like it is, it is full on. There's lots of bits, different bits that you're trying to manage. There's the short term, the medium term, the long term, trying to keep an eye on the bigger picture. But like. And what's the most important bit in the short term is the win and the win and the win. Like, you know, lots of different coaches, like him, all the different sayings that they will have to cover that. Um, so, yeah, like it's it's trying to keep both pieces going. Um, but, yeah, the family, like, is like if you commit a lot of time to something, like there always has to be a, something that's you're missing out on somewhere else. Yes. So yeah. you miss out on certain things. Um, like for us as a group, you know, the coming together, and I'm sure the same for lots of different people in lots of different walks of life to come in together again has been fantastic because you miss that kind of human interaction with like-minded people that are gearing themselves up to do something very similar because you know, like we go through this, like if you think like you're, you're, if you're involved in any team or sports club, um, you're, you, you do everything with that team, you, you sacrifice certain things or different events that you don't do because you want to commit to being involved in this game, whether that's, friends, weddings, or whatever that event is, you know, missing out family time. Um, but then you're involved in doing, like, some great things as well. So, like, that's the that's the, the kind of, I don't know, this kind of seesaw weighing scales effects. Like, you know, yeah. you know, you give too much, but, like, you got to keep the other thing going because, you know, it might not affect me because, like, as in you're, you're able to submerge your thoughts into something. Whereas it'll have a negative effect potentially on somebody else. And that's probably the thing I'm mindful of. Like, again, learning from mistakes, because I've probably seen other coaches and go cheapers, like, you know, he's, he needs to get a bit more of a grip of the bigger picture here. So um, yeah, making sure you don't get too bogged down or caught up in it. You have 50 players to think about. Like, that's a lot of, a lot of people. I didn't want to ask you earlier if it's tough or were you trying to have video sessions with the Leinster lads or, or homeschool uh, your, your kid and junior infants. I'm sure it's all fun and games both ways. You have 50 to think about. So in terms of trying to give all of them one-on-one -on -one time or get to know them or get a feel for what makes them tick, like so how does all that work? Yeah, well, there will be a process in place here where the coaches will go about that, you know, and that's from a kind of backroom point of view as well. Um, 
and I'm a bit more informal than formal than with the players off the back of that. So um, what's the right process? I don't know. Like it depends who you want to ask players or, you know, and again, it's how that like everyone is different. Like all the players are different, how they're motivated, how they see the club and the organization, um, how they see the world. Um, because they're all like, you know, you've got some players that have been playing at the time, high, highest level for 10 plus years. There's other players are coming in and have yet to play for Leinster. So um, there's a very broad spectrum mm. here. Um, so it's trying to get a bit of an understanding, get some information again, just setting them up well and constant communication um, to let players know where they sort of sit, particularly around selection, um, because okay. it doesn't do anyone any favors around stewing them open around the plates because it's, you know, ultimately why we want what's best for them. So they need to understand that. So they need to understand why they may have missed out on, you know, sometimes it's a big call, like, so as in, like, as in there's, they're nowhere near getting selected, like young players coming into the building for the first time, they're not quite ready for whatever reason, physically, or mm. they just game, game sense, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's obviously, there's some very, very tight calls at different stages of the year. Um, and that can be hard for players, but it's important that they understand where they sit in the bigger picture. And those communications are important. Um, they're not easy conversations to have, but, you know, we try to have them as best we can. Don't always get them right either. Um, but the messaging is important. Like, you know, we have a, you know, I'm sure you know, as someone who asks a lot of questions, um, the answers can be interpreted in many different ways. Yeah. Um, so it's important we understand that as well. Mm. Last point then, you've got a busy couple of weeks coming up, not least with uh, Saracens on the horizon and Pro 14, I know is obviously important in uh, a, a big way as well. Just on Saracens, because, uh, you know, they've been uh, such a force and even you think back to the final in Newcastle, uh, everybody looked forward to that. There was a real sense of the two best teams in Europe going head to head. So it's it's brilliant this quarter final is going to actually happen. Uh, they're big. So they're a big unit. They put you under a lot of pressure. When you came away from the Newcastle game, for instance, did you think as a coaching setup, we got something slightly awry there? Or do you feel like we're pretty close to the game plan and the one that we have is, is close enough to beating at this Saracens team? Where are you on that kind of a spectrum? Because it, they're a serious unit and it, there's parallels with the Ireland-England thing as well over the last years. They, they seem to be ever so slightly on top. Yeah, like the, yeah, the, yeah, the, that's a very fair question. Um, you know, Saracens first and foremost are a very, very good team. So, you know, they've been had their challenges in recent times, um, but they've a lot of big people. Um, you're right in saying that some mm -hmm. of them have moved on, but there's still plenty of them left. Um, you weren't really too sure what way it was going to wash out, and we're still yeah. not quite sure. So, um, Premiership in England will start next week, so you start to get some eyes on teams again. Um, and start to pick up the trends and have teams sort of picked up where they've left off or what sort of sort of shape and how they're performing, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll see what all that looks like. Um, there is the game itself that day. Um, you know, I thought we started the game well, like, you know, like you couldn't fault the lads in terms of their physical commitment in terms of stopping some of those big men, big bodies. And um, we get ourselves in a very good position in the game where we're, what is it, 10 points ahead. Um, at whatever 35 minutes they have a man in the bin. Um, we probably don't manage that some of that very well. You know, and like it all comes back to like it's a reflection on how we prepare the players. Um, so, you know, there's some things that we probably didn't get right as coaches. We we've discussed that extensively in the period since. Um, um the clips, you know, like they can be hard to pull out the laptop and sometimes and watch those games because they're still painful, even it's well over a year now since that mm -hmm. game uh, took place. Um but yeah, there's some things in that game, yeah, we could have potentially managed better. Um, and yeah, but then like, there's also like, you've got to give credit to the opposition as well. But you know, with, there was some chances that we didn't quite take in that game. Um, Saracens were quite clinical. And then when they get their noses in front, they're a very hard team to play catch up rugby against. Yes. Um, you see that with England as well. Um, hard to break down and play a very, have a very strong kicking game, really strangle you um, as a team. So then the last 10 minutes, I, I thought they showed us out really well and you know, we didn't look like getting back into the game. So mm. we need to probably figure that out. Like if we are if we are in that situation again, we don't intend to be, but if we find ourselves in that situation, how we can try and like unstrangle ourselves basically and get out of that kind of chokehold that a team has over us. Um, because there's a process that you need to go through 
to do it effectively. You know, you obviously got to go by two now, but it's important that we have those strategies in place. Okay. Well, listen, um, that's all on the horizon for you. Thanks so much for taking the time. It's much appreciated. And again, I know you were helping out the As I Am charity, which people can check out if uh, needed. Leo Cullen, thanks a million. Much appreciated. Thanks, guys. Yeah, really appreciate it. Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in.